Hi, I'm Father Chris Alar, the Marian Fathers here at the National Shrine of the Divine Mercy, and welcome back to Living Divine Mercy here on EWTN. Now, last week we talked about some particular Marian priests and told you about their ministries, and this week we're going to continue going a little deeper with a specific and important ministry of exorcism. Now, for that, we turn to one of our experts, Father Thaddeus Langton, as he's going to explain to you a little bit more about what exorcism really is. We are Hi, I'm Father Thaddeus Langton with the Marians of the Immaculate Conception. Today, I want to talk about exorcisms. Now, before I get to the serious side of this topic, I've given parish missions throughout the United States, and I've visited schools often attached to the parishes. And I have to say that when I preach about Jesus, I preach about the saints, often teenagers and the younger kids yawn, not so interested. They've heard that before. But then the second I mention exorcisms, just about everybody wakes up, all the hands start being raised, and they get very interested. And that's often the reaction, which in truth is a bit sad because Jesus is really good news. Exorcism and Satan is not that great a news, and yet the world today becomes more and more interested with exorcism. We see in terror movies this almost fascination with fear, terror, things that are more proper to hell than to heaven. And I think that's part of the sign of our times, which is why also exorcisms are actually picking up. Not to say that everybody is possessed or that it's just a problem everywhere, but if you hear exorcists talk, they talk about how evil is becoming more and more present in the world today. So what are exorcisms? In canon law, they are a particular form of blessing, which is why I want to start out by saying that as much as we might see in movies this battle between an exorcist and the demons, what's actually most powerful in a Catholic's life to free one from the devil is confession. That's an actual sacrament. It contains the power of the Holy Spirit to absolve you, which means in Latin to untie you from the bonds of the enemy, which is why when I've worked with my spiritual father, who helps as an exorcist down in South Texas, he won't see anybody for actual exorcism until they've made a good, thorough, and integral confession of their whole life, because that's much more powerful than many, many sessions of an exorcism, because an exorcism is an extended blessing. It is basically the attempt to set someone free enough so they can be receptive to the grace of the sacraments, because in some rare cases where there actually is possession of someone, the person is so lacking freedom, they aren't able to participate in the sacraments. So it's kind of like what we use medications for in terms of psychological illnesses. On their own, someone may not be able to overcome their depression, for instance. And so we help them with drugs for some time so they can start those routines and habits that will then help them leave depression for the rest of their lives. But the answer isn't just the prescription medicine. It's all the other things they need to do. So exorcism is like that. It's like almost a medication. It's a help along the way, but it's never the goal because the goal is liberation, freedom in Jesus Christ to become a saint, which is why often those people who've been through actual exorcisms become pretty holy. They've seen the worst of the worst. They know what it's like to encounter the devil, and they know what it's like when you sin and what the actual result of sin is. And so they're now pretty convinced from experience Jesus is the way to go. They don't want to go back to the darkness. Now, in terms of exorcism, why is it even needed? What, what is a possession? If we look at movies, like I said, we see this kind of battle almost like it's a battlefield uh, in war, which isn't quite my own experience when I've been present at exorcisms or when I've talked to others. Because possession, which is the worst case, we could say, when the devil is present in someone's body, you know, is precisely that the devil never possesses someone's soul. The devil never has rights to possess someone's soul because the soul always belongs to God, but the devil can possess a particular part of the body to the extent that the human loses their consciousness. They're not the ones responding, for instance, to the exorcist or to others during the prayer. Now, what often happens, and this is the sensational part, is what's called a manifestation. Now, demons are kind of like vampires. They don't like the light, 
and not so much daylight like orcs, but they dislike spiritual light. And so someone who's possessed could be quite normal in different facets of life, but let's say go to a retreat for the first time in a while and are before the Blessed Sacrament, and then they begin to react uncontrollably. That's what we call a manifestation. The spiritual light of Jesus in the Eucharist makes the demon react and is upset because that love from Jesus hurts the demon. The demon is basically trying to make the person leave the presence of Jesus. It's the same thing we see in the Gospels. Whenever Jesus enters a territory where they're demoniacs, the demons begin to react right away because they know who Jesus is and they don't want him around. Now, the good thing about Jesus is that he is the chief exorcist. When we talk about exorcism in the church, it's not about the holiness of this particular priest or this exorcist is really good. Certainly, we think about someone like Padre Pio, who's very holy and had great efficacy in driving out demons by his very presence and holiness. But it's Jesus in the Gospels who cast out demons. Now, in modern language, we often hear today, well, maybe these people just had mental illness or maybe it was epilepsy. One has only look at a scientist like Adam Bly, who was a thorough atheist, and in his psycho psychological studies actually began to study exorcisms to show that there's no such thing. The irony is he became a Catholic. He now helps in exorcism teams because he found out that there is no psychiatric or psychological explanations for true cases of possession. It is the limit of what science can explain and where the supernatural becomes abundantly evident. But the church is quite slow to say that there is an actual case of possession and quite slow to give permission for an actual exorcism to avoid the sensationalism of this kind of fight and to make sure that it isn't a psychological reality. Just because someone might call the exorcist or show up to the diocesan office and say, I need an exorcism, doesn't mean that they're actually going to get it right away. Because in my own experience and those of others, there's often quite a mixture of human wounds and spiritual reality. Because we are spiritual creatures. Our humanity is taken up with the Holy Spirit and sometimes also with evil spirits. So it takes a whole process of discernment and signs that the church lists to make sure that it really is a possession. It really is diabolical influence. For instance, knowledge of things that would be impossible for the person to know, being able to speak languages that the person has no capacity to speak, or being able to do things otherwise that are just impossible for human beings, like walking up walls or growing certain feathers or wings or many other things that I won't get into right now. But there have to be clear signs because the church wants to address the demonic reality directly, and to t address the human reality on its own terms also. There are other levels of what are called demonic interaction with human beings. There's possession, which is the possession of a particular part of the body, but there's also oppression, which I'll explain after I first mention obsession. Now, we think of the word obsession when someone's, you know, obsessed with, for instance, Lionel Messi, one of the best Argentinian soccer players. When I lived in Argentina, his t-shirt was everywhere. People think about him. They talk about him. They're proud of him. They have shirts about him. Now, that's not a bad, per se, obsession. He's a really good soccer player. But obsession in this context refers to this incapacity to stop thinking about certain things, especially negative things negative thoughts that keep recurring about oneself, about others. You know, in psychology, they call it intrusive thoughts. We certainly have our own human brokenness, but demons also whisper into us. They can have their own thoughts, and they, kind of like bullies, will keep at it. They want to keep their lies up to break us down emotionally and psychologically. But when that obsession gets so strong, it can turn into an oppression, whereas it's no longer just an internal part, internal attack, it becomes something external too. They begin to lose their jobs. They might even begin to get sick. Relationships begin to break down. Things just inexplicably begin to happen in their home. And that's where oppression begins to happen, when it extends out from the person to their concrete life. And that's where we can have you know, minor exorcisms. What I've mentioned so far, technically speaking, is a major exorcism. That's the solemn rite that's used rather not that frequently. <laughs> but minor exorcism is part of baptism. It's part of RCIA. 
when the church when the priest asks for the person to be freed from the power of Satan. But minor exorcism is also what in other countries is called deliverance or liberation. When we recognize, you know, the need to go to a father, to a priest, and say, I'm having these constant intrusive thoughts, and I just need a blessing. I need you to be able to bind these spirits to help set me free from these. And I found in my priestly ministry that's been incredibly helpful, not only to help others with, but for me too, because I can also be under attack as a priest. And that's something just to be aware of. As Cyrex says in chapter 2 to his own son, my son, if you desire to serve the Lord, prepare for battle. And Job says the same, life on earth is a constant battle. We are in a spiritual battle. And far from exorcism being only reserved to certain rare instances, we all need prayers and help so that we can be freed even from light influences of the devil. Because to be honest, who wants them around? St. Faustina said that one of the worst torments of hell is just the mere sight of Satan, just even having him around. And as Catholics, we shouldn't even have them around. They shouldn't even be part of our life. And so we can ask those who are trained to give us a blessing when in time of need, when we find we can't break free from certain things in our life so that the Holy Spirit can untie those bounds and we can be free for Jesus Christ. So if you find that you endure any of these difficulties or qualify, as it were, for obsession or oppression or anything of the sort, you can seek your local priest. And he can be the one that could then direct you to the diocesan office for an exorcist if that's the case. But God willing, more and more priests today are able to say a simple binding prayer, prayer for deliverance when we have difficulties with the devil and with these thoughts that occur in our minds. Thank you very much for listening. God bless. And now back to Father Chris. Well, thank you, Father Thaddeus, for that very informative segment. Now, I had the honor of sitting down recently with a very well-known exorcist named Father Lampert from the Diocese of Indianapolis, and he shared with us some more information about exorcism. It's an honor to have you with us. Thank you for joining us. Yes, it's a pleasure to be with you today. Well, Father, let us start off with probably the most common question that you get. Why is exorcism ministry so important today? I think exorcism ministry is so important today because faith is in decline. And I always believe, you know, I've, I've been an exorcist now for 18 years. And I always tell people, I don't believe the devil necessarily has upped his game today. But it does seem to be that more people are willing to play the devil's game. And they're playing the devil's game because faith is in decline. People are not taking their relationship with God seriously. And the end result is that people can be opening up an entry point for the demonic into their lives. So the ministry is so important because a lot of people today are moving away from God. And by not being in the realm of God, they're entering into the realm of the evil one. Please share with us some of the more common uh, mistakes people make mm -hmm. in opening the door to evil. Yeah, there are many entry points that one can have. Some of the ones that I've seen over the years that I've done the ministry that seem to be more commonplace, the most prevalent one would be ties to the occult. The word occult mm -hmm. comes from the Latin word occultus, meaning hidden or secret, and it focuses on knowledge of the paranormal. Its basic premise is that people want a glimpse into the future, and so they bypass God, and the evil one is more than willing to provide people with information that necessarily isn't true, but it kind of is, uh, I know, tantalizing, if you will. So it kind of tickles people's ears. And in doing so, you know, when you think of things of the occult, think of like magic, uh, witchcraft, going to see a psychic or a medium, the use of a Ouija board, all these types of things can be very dangerous because the real power behind the world of the occult is the power of the evil one. Well, and Father, you know, a lot of people don't want to believe, well, God, you know, a good God would never allow this to happen. Maybe you could answer for us, why would God allow somebody to be possessed, even in cases where maybe it'd be an innocent soul? Yeah, I think there's always a big difference between what God desires and what God permits. God would certainly desire that all of us would lead very holiest and virtuous lives, we all know that we can fall into the trap of sin, and we fall into the trap of sin. Do we repent? Do we seek God's divine mercy? 
or do we somehow try to justify that and then move away from God? So it isn't what God desires, but God does permit it because God respects human freedom. When we start to believe that freedom means we can do whatever we want, then we end up becoming slaves to our own passions and desires. And certainly the evil one is always ready to insert himself into that level of brokenness and take our lives and really take a bad situation and make them even worse. Could you share with us, I, I'd, I'd like this question, if I could, to be in two parts. Uh, one, if a person believes there is either um, an oppression or obsession or maybe even a possession, mm -hmm. um, what do they do? Where, what kind of route should they take? You know, if you're feeling sick, you go and see your family doctor who then assesses you and then perhaps may refer you to a specialist. So it should really be the local parish priest who would make the referral to the exorcist in the diocese for a deeper evaluation to determine whether or not extraordinary demonic activity really is at place. Then uh, in my diocese, most exorcists perhaps may have to have uh, kind of compile the case together and then present it to the local bishop who then would give permission on whether or not to do the formal rite of the church. You know, the, yeah. the bishop is the exorcist in his diocese. It's based on chapter 9, Luke's Gospel. Jesus sends the 12 out, gives them authority over all unclean spirits. And we know that the bishops are the successors to the apostles. So they have that authority, and they can bestow that authority on one or more of their priests. So if I make the determination that, you know, the rite does need to be performed, and I've taken the necessary steps of making sure the person has had some type of physical examination to rule out any physical cause. So that's done by a medical doctor. Having the person have some type of mental health evaluation to determine whether or not is it psychological of what they're dealing with. Yep. I have an intake questionnaire that helps me determine what the portal, the entry point was for the demonic into the person's life. The next step would be to really help the person renew their connection with God. So maybe the person did grow up in a traditional Christian home, fell away from the church, and in doing so, made this connection with the demonic. In fact, I believe that's the most important thing, is to help a person renew their spiritual life. The demons will always be removed if the person is sincere in their desire, but they ah. have to make sure that they're not giving the demonic something to hold on to. You know, in my wow. experience is there's a lot of people that want the demon to go away, but they don't necessarily want to invite God in. And that is really the key. I would even say that casting the demon out is the easy thing, but God has to be invited wow. in. We think of Luke's gospel, uh, I believe it's in chapter 11, where it says once the demon has been cast out, it goes and wanders through the arid wasteland and then coming back, and finding a house swept clean, meaning it's gone, that God has not been invited in. Then it goes and finds seven other demons worse than itself, and they come and take up residence in the person. And I have seen a growing trend in this world that, that's becoming less faith-based, where many people will treat the exorcist as a magician. People will think that I have certain powers or abilities. And I always remind people that if they're relying solely on me, we're all in trouble. But if they're relying on the power and the authority of Christ that he's given to the church and to the church's ministers, that's the right mentality to have. But there's a lot of people that want evil to go away, but don't necessarily want to invite God in. But God is the key in overcoming any demonic influence. One of the talks that you did, you mentioned that demons do not always want to manifest uh, mm -hmm. themselves, so that sometimes they prefer not. Uh, why would that be? Because when a demon shows its power, then by revealing itself, then the battle against it will begin. The demon would prefer to remain hidden. But we can even say that in the rite of exorcism, everything that's done in the rite is meant to cause the demon to manifest. Because once it manifests, then the battle against it can begin. But they would prefer to remain in the shadows, if you will. But again, in the right, they're dragged into the light of Christ, just like a cockroach in the light. And when the light shines on them, they will flee and scurry right away. 
So, Father, maybe you could share with us uh, how have you seen some of these manifestations from levitations or talking in guttural voices or foreign languages, archaic ancient languages? And I've seen it, all kinds of manifestations. And all the manifestations are meant to instill fear because the demon wants to convince everyone around that it has more power, that it's in control, and it's greater than God, if you will. So I've seen things like eyes rolled in the back of the head, growling, snarling, foaming at the mouth. I've seen levitation. I've done an exorcism here in the United States when the demon manifested the person in front of me, their eyeballs turned green, their pupils became slanted like a serpent. And when I reference Jesus Christ, the demon says to me, who's he? He has no power over us. So again, it's really all this notion of wanting to instill fear. The temperature in the room can drop. There's very strong vocal outburst. I've seen demons when they possess a body, the body will drop to the floor and slither like a snake across the floor. But again, all of these things are meant for the devil to say, don't look at what God's trying to do here. Look at the power that I have. Is it a correct statement that we could say, in a way, because of his pride, Satan really does fear Mary more than God because he knows to lose to a 15-year-old Jewish girl is just not really a, 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 a thing that he would want to say has happened. <laughs> Certainly, the Blessed Mother is probably the most powerful ally that anyone can have who's dealing with any type of demonic influence. Because the devil, you know, his sin is the sin of pride. And what crushes pride is humility. And our Blessed Mother is the greatest example of humility. You know, you think of Eve in the garden where God says, this is my plan. And Eve says no to God. It's Mary when the Archangel Gabriel appears and says yes to God, that she reverses that order and then allows God's plan of redemption for humanity to come into place. So, The Blessed Mother is just probably the greatest friend that we can have for anyone who's dealing with demonic influence. Father, thank you so much for your time. We're very grateful uh, to share your wisdom and your experience. And God bless you. We need need this kind of knowledge in fighting the battle uh, against the evil one. So, Father, we appreciate it, and God bless you. Thank you. Then a blind and mute demoniac was brought to him, and he healed him, so that the mute man spoke and saw. And all the people were amazed and said, Can this be the son of David? But when the Pharisees heard this, they said, It is only by Beelzebul, the prince of demons, that this man cast out demons. Knowing their thoughts, he said to them, Every kingdom divided against itself is laid waste and no city or house divided against itself will stand. And if Satan casts out Satan, he is divided against himself. How then will his kingdom stand? And if I cast out demons by Beelzebul, by whom do your sons cast them out? Therefore, they shall be your judges. But if it is by the Spirit of God that I cast out demons, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. If God is truly merciful, how can any sin be unforgivable? Jesus teaches us that God is eager to forgive us, but the gift of grace he offers must be received. Sadly, some people put up impenetrable barriers to the working of divine grace in their hearts. Such an obstacle to salvation takes one of two forms. On the one hand, A person might cling to pride and take the attitude, I don't need God's forgiveness. After all, I'm one of the good people. On the other hand, a person might choose to despair and insist, after all that I have done, God could never forgive me. I am a hopeless case. My sins are greater than his mercy. As the Catechism tells us, there are no limits to the mercy of God. But anyone who deliberately refuses to accept his mercy by repenting rejects the forgiveness of his sins and the salvation offered by the Holy Spirit. Such hardness of heart can lead to final impenitence and eternal loss. God will not force his love on us. 
It is up to us to accept the mercy he offers. After the adoration, halfway to my cell, I was surrounded by a pack of huge black dogs who were jumping and howling and trying to tear me to pieces. I realized that they were not dogs, but demons. One of them spoke up in a rage. Because you have snatched so many souls away from us this night, we will tear you to pieces. I answered, if that is the will of the most merciful God, tear me to pieces, for I have justly deserved it, because I am the most miserable of all sinners, and God is ever holy, just, and infinitely merciful. To these words, all the demons answered as one, Let us flee, for she is not alone. The Almighty is with her. And they vanished like dust like the noise of the road, while I continued on my way to my cell, undisturbed, finishing my te Deum and pondering the infinite and unfathomable mercy of God. Well, thank you everybody for joining us. And as we heard Father Lampert discuss the dangers of occult New Age practices, be with us next week as we discuss this topic in more detail. Until then, may Almighty God bless you, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. <laughs>